good lead in to our first speaker of the semester, uh, Arpita Sen. Um, she's been working uh, for several years on some very interesting problems in biology. And the title of her talk is Information Theory in Cell Biology, a Necessary Synergism for Battling Cancer and Genetic Diseases. Um, so I think she's going to give an introduction to, to what she's working on, perhaps how some of those of you in other fields might lend your expertise to helping solve this problem. So thank you very much, Rapita, for kicking off the semester. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to let me speak here. So um, today, in, in volume, please. Oh sure. Now, there. So uh, today I will talk about information theory and cell biology. So at a first glance, these two fields seem to be very diverse. However, a synergism between these two fields is required to progress science. So this image represents a cell, a very very complicated entity. So we as cell biologists, we perform experiments on these cells and we uh, strive to understand the mechanisms that goes on in these cells. And eventually we aim to understand what causes disease and to cure it. And this is where information theory comes in because we, ge we generate lots and lots of data. And information theory can help us analyze these data and generate meaningful information so understanding patterns, generating interaction graphs, and so on. And information theory can then further analyze this data and give us an idea of what is important. For example, it can help us identify potential therapeutic agents which we can test using cell biology again. So today I will talk about uh, some of the work that's going on in my lab that pertains to a synergism between this information theory and cell biology, and how we are using it to uh, fight cancer and different genetic diseases. So what is a cell? So similar to information theory and cell biology, there is something called cell theory. And according to cell theory, a cell is the basic unit of structure and function of all living beings. So every living being is composed of cells. So for example, take a human being. So human beings are composed of organs and organ systems. So if we zoom in in these organs, then we will be able to find that they are each composed of these individual cells. And interestingly, each cell is very different in structure and in function. So the, the difference is striking. However, there are certain unifying features in their structure and function as well. For example, all cells contain a nucleus, all cells contain a boundary, which is a cell membrane, and so on. And also, there are certain functions that are common to all cell types. And one of these functions is what we are interested in, which is endocytosis. So what is endocytosis? It is basically internalization. And a very good analogy to um, endocytosis is eating. So cells um, uptake nutrients and it engulfs within itself. So endocytosis, since it is good for eating, it's important for nutrient uptake. Now cells uh, intake, cells uptake uh, nutrients and also several growth factors that signal the cells whether to grow, to divide, and so on. So therefore, endocytosis is good for cell growth and proliferation of cells. And additionally, if you notice, a region of the plasma membrane of the cell is also internalized during endocytosis. Therefore, sure. I, um, I didn't understand how it is related to cells and signaling, I mean. Um, does it, in, like the cell signaling uh, that comes from microsome, like, does it affect the rate of metabolism that it does mm -hmm. or how they interact with each other? So it depends on what it is in internalizing. For example, it can internalize something called growth factors that promotes growth. Mm -hmm. So if those molecules are internalized, mm -hmm. then it will signal the cells to grow more. That makes mm -hmm. sense? So did that answer your question? Um, I was wondering, so 
this, this like process itself does not do any signaling. It's a receiver of signaling, you mean? Uh, yes. So it's slightly more complicated than that, but so the process itself can create uh, internal structures that can also signal. But uh, what we are talking about right now is what you're saying. So these molecules, they are causing the signaling effect right now. So uh, now, when the process occurs normally, uh, the health status of cell is fine. So all the cells are healthy. But in each case, some abnormality can happen. For example, an abnormal nutrient uptake might lead to diseases like hypercholesterolemia. If the cell growth or proliferation is not normal, it leads to cancer. And if the control of membrane composition is not normal, it leads to several developmental defects. So what we focus on in our lab is to understand the mechanisms of these fundamental cellular processes, like endocytosis, and understand its relevance in health and disease. So since we are cell biologists, we look at cells and try to understand these mechanisms. So cells can be obtained from a number of different organisms. And in our lab, we work with these uh, unicellular organisms, budding yeast or baker's yeast that is used to make bread. So each of these sphere essentially represents one single cell. And we also work with more complicated systems like mammalian cells, for example, cells from human beings. And what tools do we use? So we do a lot of uh, genetics. We do a lot of biochemistry to understand interactions between uh, different proteins. And we also do a lot of cell biology where we directly look at cells. So in order to understand a mechanism, it is important to understand what the components do. And once we understand uh, the components, we can understand how the process works. So uh, let me give you a very uh, simple and naive example. So take a phone for example. So if so, so in order for a phone to function, all these components are not equally important. So for example, if we remove the plastic cover of the phone, the phone will still function. However, if we remove the battery, the phone will not function anymore. So that is how we know that the battery is more important than the plastic cover. And this this is almost exactly how we do cell biology. So in cells, the different components are genes and proteins, and this process is endocytosis in our case. So we uh, remove these different genes or proteins at a time, and then we try to see which of them is important for endocytosis. And once we identify these important genes or proteins, then we can determine if they are important for disease as well. And then once we identify this uh, pathway, we can potentially identify therapeutic agents. But do you assume that only one gene actually controls it or the network of genes? It's a network problem. of genes and that is what it makes so, you, so much more complicated. Yeah. So you can identify a set of genes that you expect that actually uh, are important and then how they work together is a different story. Yeah? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. this is an oversimplified uh, way of looking Good. at yes. this. Each time, do you need one gene or do you need multiple genes? You so it depends on what you're looking at. So, um, so cells are very complicated, right? So if you just delete one protein, it might not affect anything just because there is another protein that compensates for its function. So sometimes deleting one protein is enough to look at a function, but several times, most of the times, we, delete to, we need to remove multiple proteins at a time. So how do you know how many proteins to take? Because if I think in terms of parameter space, mm -hmm. suppose I have thousand parameters. Now the number of combinations that you have that you have to receive to know whether a particular set will cause it is or not is infinite. Mm -hmm. So is so, that methodology? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the most reliable method is uh, to look at the proteins themselves. So some proteins are very similar to each other. So since they are so similar, it is, 
So since they're so similar in structure, it is uh, usually they have similar functions as well. So you delete one protein, it doesn't affect anything. So you delete the other protein that is very similar to that protein as well, and so on and so forth. So usually there are um, usually there aren't thousands of proteins that have exactly similar structures. So may, say I'm just giving you a random number, maybe five, six, and so on. So you can delete all of them and see what the effect is like. And also uh, from the literature, we already know a lot about how different proteins are. For example, in yeast, the whole genome has been sequenced. So it's very easy to identify what to delete and how to delete this. Kind of, even though it is sequenced, but we don't know like the function of all of them. Like, um, so the sequence is basically the key to a function, and I will talk about that right. later on. So, um, so basically, yeast is a very simple organism, and so proteins are made up of different uh, parts. And each, and if we know that this part is present in another protein and it has this function, so it can be assumed that even in this protein it will have the same function. So those are called domains of a protein. So every time you delete a set of proteins, you do some experiments to check mm -hmm. whether there is something happen. And based on this uh, feedback, you decide whether you go on with the mm -hmm. sequential decision process or we stop somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And so you can imagine the amount of data that is generated by this process. Yeah, we sort of discussed almost all of what I was going to talk about. <laughs> okay. So um, we have all these tools and we have all these cells. So therefore we generate huge amounts of data. So this is just after deleting one gene or one protein, or a couple of genes or a couple of proteins. However, cells have thousands of such proteins. So therefore, this data gets multiplied by thousands. And by doing this trial and error multiple times, we are able to identify the important genes or proteins for the process that we are interested in. Are you organizing this data from the beginning in some structure or you just put it to a back and after that you worry what's going to happen? Mm, we organize it from the beginning because we need to realize if there's a difference or not. So we look at the normal cell and we look at the cell in which the protein is not there and we see if there's any difference or not. And then we go on or we analyze that more. So do you look correlation between the data as a clone or? We compare the data with the normal cell. Ah, so you have data from normal cell and then you have... Exactly. Data from uh, the cell in which the protein is not there. So there's always something to compare it to. There's always a standard. So you compare raw data or you, or you uh, structure the data in some biological network and then you can see whether some edges are missing or something like that? Um, we compare the raw data. Raw data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so Shahin, don't you think that if they do something a little more structure, yeah. might help? Yeah, actually there is a like 2010 work I used that not for like uh, more than two, but what they do is to like do synthetic metal analysis to, for a pair of genes mm -hmm. and they model it as like a whole like genome-wide mm -hmm. um, network that says uh, even though this specific gene is not uh, essential, mm -hmm. but we don't know if we, that's because it has another, as you call it, similar okay. like protein or gene that does the same thing, or there's other buffering mechanism in the cell mm -hmm. that compensate mm -hmm. for that. So they model those pairwise like interactions as network, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but they don't go any further yeah, than yeah, two. Yeah. But so analyzing raw data is a huge task. So anything like that that could. Uh, make the work automated or make the work more structured would definitely be better. So um, once we identify the important uh, genes or proteins, then we can work with that. So uh, since we need to do this process multiple times, we need to process large volumes of data and quickly extract information. And this is exactly where information theory comes in. So. Uh, it can be done manually in a small scale. However, the time that it takes is a lot more. And also, when you're quantifying something manually, it's easy to miss uh, subtle differences between the data. 
which an automated process could definitely uh, help us with. Uh, Professor, you, you have already identified the important genes and proteins, mm -hmm. right? And based on that information, what kind of uh, information you still want to extract? Yeah. Um, so this part of the process, that generates a lot of information. So in order to identify them in the first place, we need to analyze large volumes of data. And once we identify them, then we need to understand the mechanism of how is it affecting the process. So you still need to identify the important genes and proteins. That's the first step. You complete this step or you still want to do it. So, so, so cells have a number of different proteins. So if you think about it as a broad picture uh, point of view, then this process is never completed. Because one protein might be important for a lot of different things. However, even when you identify it, so we are focusing on just endocytosis, and we know that, okay, this protein A is important for endocytosis, but now we need to generate more information to understand how is protein A important for endocytosis? What exactly is it doing? Well, you want to zoom in how this protein identified really gets the impact yes, yes, on yes, the yes. part. We, we keep on zooming in, oh. so there's no dot of information. <clears throat> I guess maybe as uh, sort of computer science people, what we're wondering is um, what steps are you looking to apply the information theory to? And like, what's your data input format? Is it like a whole batch of numbers with another <laughs> classification? Or is it a whole batch of numbers with like a number which is some sort of rating right. or something? So, um, so basically for my project, I need to analyze images a lot. So I need to take picture of cells, and then I need to uh, need to sort them out in different categories. So I will talk about that as well. Okay. And so, so that takes a lot of time. And that I think that since we do it manually, we might be missing some information, which could provide a lot more insight into what is actually going on. And that is where information theory will be good for us. Is it cell itself or colony of cell that you can like analyze its growth or? Um, sometimes we work with colonies of cells, but usually my project is more dependent on Same one cell at a time. So one such protein that is important for endocytosis is Epsom. And this is the protein that we work with in our lab. So we know that Epsom is important for endocytosis. And we know that if endocytosis it's, is not normal, then it can lead to several defects like cancer and developmental diseases. Now this is one circuit by which diseases could be caused. But Epsom has a very rare and interesting feature. So Epsom is a protein that can cause these diseases when it's misregulated. So this is something most proteins don't do. So most proteins follow this circuit, but Epsom can follow this circuit as well. So uh, as um, I discussed before, we work with both button E cells and mammalian cells. So I will not talk about um, mammalian cells in details today because my project focuses on the yeast cells. But very briefly, what we have identified is Epsom is important for a number of different human cancers, including bladder cancer and pancreatic cancer. And at this point, we are also trying to um, uh, we are also trying to use endocytosis for targeted drug delivery to bladder cancer cells. And um, Epsom is also important in developmental defects. For example, a disease called Low Syndrome that affects children. And these children, they're born with cataracts and they have to undergo surgery right after birth. And they have mental retardation and kidney dysfunction that aggravates with age. And they rarely survive our uh, teens. So we are um, working with the Low Syndrome Trust and we are hoping to uh, understand this disease and possibly identify therapeutic agents. So what I will focus on today is uh, the budding E cells. So as we talked about, Epsom is important for cancer. And one of the hallmarks of cancer is abnormal cell proliferation. So 
we are using budding yeast as a system to study this abnormal cell proliferation. And then we expand our work to mammalian cells. So this is how a budding yeast divides. So an yeast is a very spherical cell. It gives off a small bud, which grows in size, something like this, and then separates from its mother cell to form an individual cell of its own. So when Epsin function is normal, then this is what uh, yeast cells divide like. So each cell forms a bud, which breaks off and gives off a bud of its own. Now, if Epsin function is deregulated, then this is what happens. So the control of this proper cell division is completely lost. Instead, we have these hyper-elongated buds that cannot separate from the mother cell any longer. And this abnormal cell division that is controlled by Epsin is also conserved in mammalian cells. Regulates whether Epsin is performing normally or abnormally. So, so, um, so yes, other proteins might regulate Epsin, but also Epsin regulates itself. So, a protein is made up of different regions, and some of these regions of Epsin are important for controlling itself. So, this is when Epsin is deregulated in itself. So, the regulatory regions of Epsin are missing. And that, is, that was my question, actually, for this project. So which region of Epsin is required for its regulation? I don't understand the question. <coughs> OK, so let me explain to you. So Epsin is a protein. And proteins are made up of amino acids. So amino acids are chemical compounds that are building blocks of the protein. And when one amino acid binds to another amino acid, it forms a sequence of amino acids. So a protein can be called to be a sum of all amino acids. So, um, so just to, uh, so I will answer your question, just take me two minutes. So this uh, representation of amino acid is cumbersome. So in order to make life simpler, there is something called amino acid alphabet, in which each one of those amino acids have been assigned a single alphabet. And, and when we look at the alphabets, we know that this is what it represents. So for example, this sequence could be represented just by its one letter codes. And this uh, sequence of amino acid encodes functions of the whole protein. So if we could understand what this sequence, uh, what the function of this sequence is, we could know what the protein is good for. So uh, now to answer your question, Epsin is made up of these 454 amino acids. So this is what Epsin could be spelled out in terms of amino acid. So when I say that my question is which region of Epsin is important for its regulation, I mean which amino acid or which groups of amino acid are important for its regulation. So you have not interested in structure, secondary or ternary. You basically look at linear structure. Yes, yes. And and the, so the linear structure is important because that's the basis of the protein folding. So once we know what uh, sequence is important, we will know that, OK, this is important for folding of the protein to secondary or tertiary structures and so on. And one other question, does it mean that alternative, uh, alternative splicing up like the initial gene does not affect on the sequence that it makes? Uh, so alternative splicing does affect sequence. So uh, I'm sorry, what? Uh, so basically, if we have a, a different splicing for uh -huh. the same like gene, we can have different sequences for yes, the same yes. sequence, like um, let's say protein. Uh -huh. So when you are saying that we are looking at those subsets uh -huh. that are effective, uh -huh. which splicing are you assuming that it's okay, following? So in East. So, so we work with yeast, right? And in yeast, those alternative splicing mechanisms almost doesn't happen. So, um, so we know for sure that this is the sequence of Epsin. 
And to answer your question, if that was to happen, then we would start with the minimum required region and then identify what is important for that protein. Okay, so in here what I'm trying to identify is what amino acids of this protein are required for regulating the cell division abnormality. So the, the amino acids that you see underlined in blue, so these are the ones whose functions are already known. And the rest in black, so we don't understand what the function of these sequences are. So how do we do our experiment? We start with the amino acid, we perturb it, which means we change it or remove it. And then we ask the question if the cell division returned to normal or not. And then we move to the next amino acid and so on. Again, this is a very oversimplified view of what you do. But it could be, yes, you deleting substrate called secretive matrix, but it could be that the, for the function, you have um, thick uh, amino acids that are falling apart, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. Because folding might actually be... Absolutely, absolutely. And so and there this are means exponential increase of mm -hmm. possibility, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So what we actually do is uh, we look at the secondary structure of a protein and we see what regions are important for folding and then we target those amino acids. Yeah. Yeah. So again, my question will remain that you have 400 amino acids here. Mm -hmm. and so the idea is to make uh, educated guesses. So guess would be a wrong word. So anyway, so as we just discussed, there are 454 amino acids. So this would be a huge task to identify which ones are important. So uh, as uh, I just explained, so we look at secondary structure of the protein, which basically tells us how the protein folds. So that. Uh, basically um, gives us an idea of what the candidate regions could be. So we looked at the secondary structures and we uh, and also we looked at these uh, stretches of Qs. So Q is basically um, an amino acid and why did we find it to be so interesting? So the reason is these Qs are known to be important for uh, to be involved in neurodegenerative disorders like uh, Huntington's disease. So these diseases, they cause a degeneration of brain cells. So this was uh, one of the candidate regions that we looked at. So we started to mutate one Q at a time. Actually, we started to mutate multiple Qs at a time, by, again, looking at the structure and so on. But this is a simplification. So how do we do our experiments? So once we mutate these uh, cues or remove these cues, uh, then uh, we grow up the cells that express proteins having those changed cues. And we uh, make slides which are uh, put under the microscope and we take images of them. And to uh, remove most of the bias, what we do is we uh, we uh, divide the cover slip. So this is the cover slip under which the cells are there. So we divide them into nine imaginary quadrants, and we take three images per quadrant according to this uh, Greek pattern. So this approach is to remove all, remove all bias, to treat all samples equally. And once we do this, we generate a lot of data. And then we need to analyze these cells and ask the question again, is cell division normal? So now again, the other problem is, in biology, most of the things cannot be, exp cannot be explained as yes or no. So there is always a large amount of variability. So for example, if you see these figures, so these are all yeast cells, just uh, imaged in a different way. So circular cells means that they are normal. If they are mildly branched, so the cell division is less uh, normal. However, if they are severely branched, that means the cell division is extremely normal, uh, extremely abnormal. So that means that we cannot answer this question as yes or no. Instead, we need to divide these cells into different categories of severity. So we came up with a method called circularity. 
which is a measure of severity of abnormal cell division. And uh, this is how circularity is calculated. So basically the idea is that if a cell is a circle, that is good. So the more circular a cell is, the more normal it is. So after you calculate circularity, you can see that normal cells, they approach a value of one. That means they are very much circular. Mildly affected cells like these, they have a value of 0.6. However, severely affected cells have a value of 0.2. And after we do all of these uh, analysis of the data, then we can uh, plot graphs and do statistical significance tests. So this shows you a box plot where this line is the median and this is the whole range of data. So you can appreciate how variable the data is. So this is, uh, so about 20% is the amount of abnormal cell division that a deregulated epsilon causes. However, when a Q is perturbed, then this uh, cell division defect goes down. So this tells you that the Qs are important for epsilon regulation. Another question. Um, when you see multiple like cells parted from the model cells because as like even the dollar cell starts to grow, it might put itself. Mm -hmm. So how do you identify when you are trying to say how much is, let's say, circularity of that cell? How do you identify different cells among like the growing uh -huh. cells? So um, basically, when a cell cannot bud off or sever from the mother cell, mm -hmm. then it forms a branched, uh, a branched uh, morphology. Which attaches like to the mother cell, like for it, it, yeah, like, it cannot separate. So the cell is uh, always attached. So this is the mother cell. Mm -hmm. It had formed a bud, and it couldn't separate. But it formed a bud of its own and another bud, and so on. So this is a very branched uh, morphology. So therefore, this is not a circle. So the actual circle would have been this. Did you also, yeah, I mean, in your lab, um, process to how like this site? Um, process effects like cell cycle, I mean, what, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. causes that effect? Yeah, yeah, we analyzed all that. So we know uh, exactly what stage in the cell cycle it affects and why this happens and so on. When you were uh, counting perimeter and area, uh, was that by hand or did you have some image processing thing? Um, you can just choose Photoshop. So it tells oh. you circularity. Okay. Uh, so we need to uh, select the cell as uh, well as possible. So including all the edges and uh, branches and so on. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it might be very better in other methods, and, and that would be yeah, interesting to a, hear about. It. Yeah, it's a very time-consuming and demanding process, and I'm sure it could be analyzed in a much better way. Right. This is not my research area, but um, <coughs> I wrote a program that did something similar but it was um, it was for measuring uh, defects in windscreens of planes where you stick a grid behind it and you look for wobbles in the lines in the mm -hmm. grid when you take a picture through this. Uh -huh. So it was line identification and then count variance and mm -hmm. it would probably, I mean, you could probably, somebody who actually like does this could probably make something up for that relatively easily because I had no idea what I was doing, it didn't take me that long. so. Uh -huh. <coughs> yeah, that could be great. So, um, so this circularity varies with time, right? So suppose the cell that you have shown on the right mm -hmm. uh, at this moment. So, uh, so and that is the exact reason that you need to you need to count as many cells as possible, so that by uh, increasing the population size, you are um, sort of uh, lowering the variability. So you need to count at least 200 cells, and each experiment needs to be repeated at least nine times. So that is how um, you know that I'm not just choosing all the cells uh, that are, say, early in the cell cycle, and therefore they look like this, and the others are later in the cell cycle, and so on. And also the other thing that you could do is um, we can control um, the timing in which the cells bud, so you could uh, sort of uh, experiment with the samples at the same time. So uh, to conclude, we have taken a very small step in identifying the 
spelling of Epson. So we know that the cues are important, but still there is a lot more experiments to be done on this. And we would definitely appreciate the help of the nature theory to uh, perform this task. So, uh, to, so to conclude, I would like to acknowledge my lab. So this is my PI, Claudio. And this is our technician, Claudia. So this is David, an undergrad who used to work with us. Uh, this is Tebariti and I who work on East systems, and Brian and Kyle who work on uh, Mammalian systems. And uh, I would also like to thank my committee members for their constant encouragement and support. And finally, this project was uh, funded by NSF, and I would definitely like to thank the Center for Science of Information for funding me so that I didn't have to TA and I had a lot of time to work on this project. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, LSAMP Indiana, which is a program for minorities, and a number of undergrads who worked in related projects have been funded by them. And thank you for your patience and your questions. So, any other questions?